Thank you for joining us today, folks. Just a couple housekeeping items. This is our monthly office hour as the Office of Federal Emergency Relief Team. Uh, we try to pull together any new updates and any new information that we have throughout the month and provide you with just a quick overview of all those items and then have an opportunity to engage in questions and answers about the information that was presented to you. So thank you for joining us in this cooler month of October. Uh, we are also recording the office hours and we do have those posted on our website. So if you happen to have missed an opportunity to join us on a Thursday morning at nine o'clock, there is an opportunity to go back to revisit any of the material that we presented. We encourage all of you to, to take a moment to introduce yourself right in the chat box. This is a great way to create networks amongst yourselves as well as with our team. My name is Shelley Shassi Jandro. I'm the director of the Office of Federal Emergency Relief. And you folks may know that we joined, I joined this team from ESEA Federal Programs. And then our teammates will also introduce themselves. Good morning, everyone. My name is Monique Sullivan, and I am the ARP coordinator. And like Shelly, I come to this work uh, via ESDA. Good morning. I'm Karen Kusiak. I coordinate the CARES and CARISA funds. You may also know them as SR1 and SR2. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Kevin Harrington. I'm working with the GEAR and EANS grant. Good morning. I am Maisha Asha. I am fiscal coordinator. Good morning. I'm Robert Palmer, and I am the procurement analyst for the EANS funds. Good morning. I'm Rebecca Mitchell, and I'm a management analyst here. Good morning. I'm Terry Beal, and I'm a contracted invoice reviewer. And you may see another name on our invoicing side of our house. And Deanna Reverge is another management analyst working with our invoices in our school districts. The Office of Federal Emergency Relief Programs hosts a monthly office hour the first Thursday of every month at 9 a.m. And we strongly encourage everyone to register and see uh, different updates that we have going on for you. Today's topics include the liquidation of the CARES funding, liquidation extensions, the strategic planning, invoice timeline, reminder, the MO equity, subgrant opportunities, needs analyst survey. And today's objectives include gaining additional information about the federal relief timelines, process for modifications, and subgrant opportunities. So if you've been with us before, you're probably very familiar with that chart in the upper half of this slide. This lines up the three ESSER programs, CARES, CARISA, and ARP, ESSER 1, 2, and 3, and the dates that those funds must be obligated by for each of those sets of funds. So you'll notice right off that CARES, ESSER 1, had to have been, all the activities had to have been obligated by September 30th, which was last Friday. And then for each of those grants, there's a, a liquidation period, uh, a little bit longer li liquidation period for this than I think you've experienced for other grants. Um, and the liquidation period is it ends um, on December 30th, 2022 for ESSER 1, and then in the following years for the other grants as, as posted right there in the chart. So I just wanna emphasize again, the CARES ESSER 1 is in the liquidation period at this point. No longer can you obligate funds saying, oh, I have an idea for how to spend those and I'm going to order something today. No, that has to have been done already. But now you may invoice for those funds as whatever you ordered or whatever you did has been completed. And I just want to draw your attention to the definition of liquidation from the uh, 2CFR section 2343B. And I'm going to read this because each word or each phrase certainly has particular meaning. The drawing down and expenditure of funds by grantee for obligations incurred during the grant's legal obligation period. That's what that means. That's what I was just describing. Timely liquidation occurs during the legal obligation period on and through the first, well, they say 120 days 
after the final day of that period or an extension of the period by the US Department of Education. So here in Maine, we're asking for December 30th, 2022. We know that DAFS continues to do their work um, also the, in the Office of Financial Services for the state of Maine. So the next topic that we're gonna jump into is a, a fairly new topic in regards to the fact that information was just released four days ago, four business days ago. Um, and it is related to the liquidation extension update. So back in May, you folks may have heard us talk about this late liquidation extension. So it's the extension of the opportunity to continue to submit invoices for expenses that were obligated prior to 9-30-22. So just being sure that that does not change any of the obligation date for CARES. And as I mentioned, this is still very new information. It was released four business days ago. So as you can see, we've highlighted a couple of uh, key points that we've received throughout this week's office hours with the U.S. Department of Ed. So we as a grantee and you folks as a subrecipient have different expectations within the late liquidation extension. So a grantee, which is the main department of education must and may submit a liquidation extension on behalf of ourselves or on behalf of our subrecipients, which are, is our main SAUs. And as I said, may request a liquid, late liquidation extension. So this is not an automatic. There is a whole array of things uh, documented in the page that I'm going to share with you shortly in the chat box. Um, so grantees, again, knowing that we are the grantee as the department and you folks are the subrecipients. So the grantees can use both discretion and oversight in inclusion of subrecipients within this request. And we, there's a, a bunch of information kind of in that cover sheet of the document. And then there's some items that say, we as a grantee must collect significant documentation to support the liquidation extension request of its subrecipients that are included within the liquidation extension request should the grantee choose to submit a liquidation extension request. We as a team continue to have additional training and support and guidance because it is a brand new concept. This is not something that has been done in past funding and they were extremely um, critical in the regards on Tuesday that this is specific to CARES funding, that this notion of liquidation extension is not across federal programs, that they are specifically talking about CARES funding at this time. So what we did was we just took a quick snapshot of one of the pages in the, in the what they refer to as the application. It's a, a seven tabbed Excel spreadsheet. And this is the type of information should the grantee select to submit a liquidation extension on behalf of its subrecipients. This is the subrecipient information at the bare minimum that would be needed to be submitted to the US Department of Education for consideration. So as soon as we move on to the next slide, I'm going to put that link in the chat box so that you have the information as well. And we will continue to inform you once we get more information and we receive updated guidance. I just wanted to just mention a couple of things about the obligation and the liquidation. So uh, it's October and we're really, really encouraging districts to uh, next month, you know, this month, October, and next month in November, to really try to draw down those funds for the CARES um, expenditures that have been obligated, because then we'll have a better idea of what districts are looking at, um, and we'll have an idea of for any districts that may be, or SAUs that may be considering late liquidation. We really want you to focus on getting those uh, invoices in, the month of October and November and seeking assistance if you need help with that. 
So moving on to something a little less um, fiscal, and that is looking at your ESSER progress monitoring. We just finished out CARES 1, two years of funding, and really want, and, and we, we have a year under our belt of ARP and um, a little over a year for CRISA, um, less than two, but over a year for, for CRISA ESSER 2. And we're getting also some guidance from the US Department of Education and some of their technical assistance centers about how districts are using their ESSER funds. And are they looking at um, how they are using it and is it having the impact that districts want it to have? And is it affecting, is it, um, is it addressing the loss of instruction or instructional time or interrupted instruction that happened during COVID? Is it addressing all of the needs that this money was set out to address? So this is just a little, a little graphic about things you wanna look at. Um, it's the beginning of the school year. We've got a, about a month and a half under, about a month under our belt, depending on when you started. In looking at your student objectives, looking at your data, assessing the accomplishments of those goals, and then looking at, based on that data and review of that data, does your ESSER funding plan align with that data? Do you need to revise it based on the data? Is it really addressing the needs of students? Is it really addressing the objectives that, objectives that you had for that funding? And then once you work on that, communicate those next steps. That is really huge. I'll have to say, um, I open up a lot of applications for ARP and I know Karen does for ESSER too. And one thing we really want districts to focus on is making sure that it still aligns with what your community needs and what your school needs. And so that's really important when you're making updates and changes to any of your ESSER funding plans. I can go on the next slide. The next piece, this is just a chart that was released to us through one of the technical assistance centers at a comprehensive network. And ha especially when it comes to ARP and the 20% reservation, uh, which is a required the use of evidence-based interventions to address lost instructional time or interrupted instruction. And really looking at um, if you're doing tutoring, is it having the impact that it's supposed to? Are you really addressing the needs of students um, that, that was exacerbated by COVID and the loss of instructional time? So this is just a really cool chart. We know that uh, it's something that we're gonna be trying to do some technical assistance with districts and we're working that through at this point, but I thought I would throw it out there. Um, we're done with, Curse, with uh, CARES and it might be a good idea to see, did it have the impact? Did this funding really have the impact that we wanted it to? And this is again, just some things to think about um, as you're reviewing your plans, as you're reviewing your spending, as you're reviewing your objectives, it is still important to make sure you have these pieces to your ESSER funding. All ESSER funds have to either prevent, prepare for, or respond to COVID-19, um, should COVID-10, I think that was a typo. Um, and they can do all three, they can do one. I know I've mentioned this in the past, we're at a point now where we're, we're past the emergency of the pandemic. So it's probably gonna be more response to the pandemic and looking at all the impact that is happening that happened because of the pandemic. Um, and it also can address the social, emotional, mental health, academic needs of students. It doesn't fall underneath an allowable use. And usually the allowable use, uh, usually we can find an allowable use but it also still needs to fit with the uniform guidance, um, Edgar, uh, any of the cost principles. I have a lot of conversations with districts about reasonableness and necess necessity. And then the last one is more for the ARP ESSER three funding, but it still needs to meet your meaningful stakeholder consultation and SAU priorities. So if you're making changes, you need to make sure that it aligns with your meaningful stakeholder consultation, your SEU priorities, and that it also aligns with the use of funds plan that is required for ARP ESSER funds. And that use of funds plan needs to be um, accessible on your 
SEU uh, website throughout the duration of ARP, which means that goes until September 30th of 2024. We include this uh, slide just to remind you again about the timeline of our reimbursement process. So initial for initial invoice review, it takes five to 10 business days. Then it goes to our uh, Department of Administrative and Finance Services. And they, they, need, they have their own approval process and it takes from seven to 25 business days to approve the invoice and also process the payment by DAFs. And after that, it takes three to 10 business days, additional business days for reimbursement checks to be mailed. So when we are saying business days, that exclude any Saturday, Sunday, or state holidays. So in total, it might take 15 to 45 business days from invoice submission to reimbursement check receipt. We wanted to also just remind districts about the maintenance of equity requirement. And this is a fiscal and staffing equity requirement that uh, was set out in the ARP ESSER statute. We do provide one-on-one -on -one technical assistance if needed. We have provided that to several districts already. Uh, we have a lot of resources and we have a tool available on our website. We have a special section of our website that's dedicated just to ML equity. Now, not every district or every SAU in the state is required to do ML equity because some SAUs are uh, accepted. And we have a list of here on this page. We also have a list on our website of all the districts that are not accepted from ML equity, which means that these districts have to meet ML equity. And on the right side of this page is the SE, the SEA, the department has a requirement to post certain information on the S, on our website, on the, the main Department of Education website. And we've had different requirements throughout the statute, throughout the period of allowability. We had a couple last year and we also had one in July and we have another one coming up on December 31st. So for all the districts or for all the SAUs that are not accepted from needing MO equity, these are, the, these are the items that we have to post publicly on, um, on the main Department of Education website. And I wanna go through it because I think there may be a little bit of conf a confusion about what MO equity is. First of all, you're not comparing like F21 like you have to do it separately for FY22 and we have FY21. We have FY22, which we can, which um, is FY21, 22 school year. And then you also have to do it again for FY23. And it's, you have to, you have to do the computations. You have to do the math. You have to do the calculations and before you can determine if you've met the MO equity. But there's a, pup a per pupil amount for your high poverty schools. There's a pure per pupil, can't speak, speak today. There's a per pupil um, amount of funding for your district or SAU. There's a per pupil number of FTEs for your high poverty schools. There's also a per pupil number of FTEs for your for your SAU. And then you have to uh, you have to indicate if there's any kind of aggregate reduction. And then the last. Um, well, that we have to put on our website is whether an LEA met or actually when, whether an LEA did not meet MO equity for any other high poverty schools. We do have some districts that have um, you know, worked with us on this and we're willing to work with any district to get their MO equity um, calculated and, and reported out accurately. So please reach out to uh, me or Karen or Shelly, and we can provide any assistance that's needed. And then lastly, uh, the department, the US department has also um, in the last FAQ document, they really stressed they wanted SAUs. It wasn't necessarily a requirement, but it was highly encouraged that SAUs be very transparent about their ML equity and are they meeting ML equity for their high poverty schools. So these are some suggestions 
that um, that they that the U.S. Department of Education posted in their uh, ML Equity FAQ document, which was updated in July of this year, 2022, and specifically question 34 on page 23 about information that um, an SAU should make publicly available uh, on their website, um, so that so that community members, teachers, families, parents can really see how the SAU is making sure that high poverty schools. Um, that maintenance of equity is happening. Okay, announcements have gone out to schools about some sub-grants um, that are funded through the Emergency Federal Relief Program. And we want to make sure that those of you who are listening who are business managers are, or grant, um, grant coordinators are aware of these. Uh, one is to provide, or, or the grants are on this slide are the ones that are going to support students who are experiencing homelessness and also multilingual learners. And uh, we have allocations, we've calculated uh, allocations for each SAU and they are available on our website. You will get um, this slide eventually or soon and you'll be able to get the link. And I think perhaps uh, Shelley has just put in the chat the, the version of what was in the MailChimp announcement about <laughs> this particular program and, and links are active in that. Um, the applications, districts do have to apply to use these funds. Um, and we're using the um, GEM portal, the 4PCAMain.org portal. And uh, there's a, a list of what can be ex um, included in these activities. And please know that uh, these are for students experiencing homelessness and or, and or, so it's both together, multilingual learners related to preventing, preparing for, or responding to the COVID-19 pandemic from October 1st, 2021 to September 30th, 2023. So those dates are important to note. And again, that uh, link that you found in the chat will give you more information about this additional program. And then another one that uh, came out just last week, it was announced by the governor, and then uh, again, notices were sent to school districts. It, was the, it is the initiative to provide every main public school with free mobile computer science labs. And uh, applications were due. We hope you caught this, or someone from your district caught this. The, the applications had to be submitted by September 30th, last Friday. Again, they think of it as had to be obligated, right, by that day. Um, and please note this, that if your district is participating in this, the, you go ahead and order the, those materials right away because they must be invoiced by December 1st, not the 30th, December 1st, 2022. And there's more information at that link. Um, and I can make sure that that link gets in the chat because I know that um, right now you can't hot link the slide. So there has been a fair amount of information uh, that connects to our Office of Federal Emergency Relief Team uh, in the main DOE updates that come out on every Friday. One of the ones in addition to the two that Karen just mentioned, was a family and community needs assessment uh, survey. So essentially, this survey is really asking parents of kiddos that are in school, where are some needs? Where are some identified needs that you as a parent um, have seen through this pandemic? How has your kiddo been affected? So we are asking parents, oh, my apologies, the enter did not enter the link into the chat box. Um, we are asking families and parents of students to complete this survey by October 14th. It should take no more than 15 minutes. A number of the questions are related to if the child feels connected to an adult at a school in the school unit where might be some additional needs as a family that you would like to be supported with, whether that be after school programming or summer programming or outdoor education. So there's roughly 15 to 20 questions 
And we just would like to obtain this information by October 14th so that we as a team and as a department can see where might be some gaps that we could support that have been identified through this survey. So if you folks are parents, great. If you folks have parent organizations within your school district, you can share this link with them. This link has come out multiple times in the last month and a half. So if they've already completed it, thank them for their participation. And uh, we look forward to seeing what comes about within this survey. We leave you with some resources like we do um, every month. These resources are somewhat consistent. The US Department of Ed has restructured uh, many of their pages. So they're having one home page that allows you to, to tap into multiple resources like maintenance of equity or reporting or maintenance of effort or allowable uses. So they have a well, one-stop shop and have it, instead of having multiple links. So we have found that extremely helpful. In the same token, they've done the same concept with EANS for our non-public schools. Here is all of our contact information. Should you have a question or a concern and you wanna reach out to a member of our team, whether that's related to potentially engaging in conversation about um, modifying your application because new needs have been identified or new priorities have been established, or if that is a question in regards to uh, what type of documentation to include with your reimbursement request in the GEMS portal. We are here to help. We, we provide you with as much support as we can. We know that there's different levels of requests out there and we are here to meet every single one of them. Now I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen and uh, reach out to you folks to see if there's any questions that we haven't addressed thus far. We have been monitoring the chat box and there's no questions there. So we'll open up the floor and engage in any uh, verbal questions that you folks might have. Hi there, good morning. Hi there. Good morning, Mary. Just, just a quick question. Um, this is in regard to the the homeless and multilingual student. So uh, I'm not handling that. So maybe maybe I'm anticipating a question that folks don't have. But does the stipulation still hold that if it is an amount under five thousand dollars, it there still needs to be a consortium developed for that? Nope, so this is a, a completely different source of funding. So the $5,000 that you're referencing is ARP HCY, and that was a stipulation out of that statutory language. So this funding source was identified, it's CRISA funding, and it was um, identified as a need based on school districts reaching out to the state and saying they had seen a huge influx in both populations within their school. And it had incurred, for example, you know, additional transportation costs. They had hired new teachers, they had hired specialists. Um, so we really wanted to be able to address that need. So we've created this new subgrant opportunity. Which so is in addition. In addition, yep. yep. Okay, all right, perfect. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Our team will stick around for a few more minutes. If you have a question that you'd like to ask of us, we will be here. Otherwise, we appreciate your time this morning and we look forward to seeing you in November.